Uh, hello, uh, Mike Elm from the 2050 Climate Group. I'm not going to address this one to the First Minister because I know that they're doing great work supporting um, and engaging and empowering future leaders to take action on climate change here in Scotland. So my question would be to the other participants, what is uh, happening in their countries um, to empower the people who are going to be dealing with the impacts and the uh, effects of the decisions that are made uh, today? <laughs> Could you answer that for a start? From, 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 that's actually better. Not very much. Well, uh, good luck. I think, that, I think we can say that there's a consensus when it comes to these policies in Iceland among party lines. So what we are doing is trying to achieve uh, the goals we have uh, set. Uh, and uh, I, I, I don't think it's a good idea to go into, into details. There's a challenges in many, many places, especially when it comes to transportation. Uh, we are trying to uh, achieve the goals as, as soon as possible. Uh, that's one of the main things on, on the government agenda. And as, and, and as I mentioned, it's more or less uh, through uh, cross-party lines and uh, good uh, consensus with, with the Icelandic when it comes to these things. Paul? Yeah. <clears throat> what, what was the question, really? I have to... what, what are you doing to actually address the issues of climate change? Yeah. <clears throat> of course, there is a, there's a policy, and um, realizing that we are a part of the Arctic, we also look at the consequences where we are when things are changing. We um, a part of a scientific group which um, um, are very much looking at what's happening with the Gulf Stream, where the, where the hot and cold water meet, what's going to happen in the future, and, and could be um, a change there, and that will change, of course, all our existence, where, where our um, resources are um, maybe threatened or, or are um, changing, at least. So, of course, this is very important of us. We are a part of nature, living in nature, by nature. So for us, it's a, a, a question which no doubt to use all the effort we have to be a part of it. I think it is also important to realize that climate change is really as an issue about an energy transformation, as we all know. To some extent, the Paris uh, conference was an energy conference. And without a comprehensive energy transformation, uh, uh, climate change will happen in a dramatic way. And that is why the message that this, uh, what I call, northern central geopolitical triangle can give to the world in the energy question is very fascinating. And most of us are not good enough or or active enough in getting that message to other countries in the globe because the, the most difficult threshold is that people doubt whether such an energy transformation is possible from fossil fuel-based energy systems to clean energy. All our countries, Scotland, Iceland, Faroe Islands, Greenland, Norway, were for the most part of the 20th <coughs> century based on fossil fuel. I was brought up in an energy economy in Iceland where over 80% came from imported oil and coal. Now, if you take this northern North Atlantic region, Norway, Scotland, Faroe Islands, Iceland, Greenland, they are the only part of the globe where every country has reached a clean energy a transformation for electricity production, ranging from 60% to 100%. It's an extraordinary transformation, and they've all done it differently the combination of hydro, geothermal, wind, energy, and, and others. And I realized that when the first minister spoke last year at the Arctic Circle Assembly, and she explained the uh, achievement of Scotland, how you were ahead of your target in the energy transformation. So I think part of the global role for this new north that we are talking about here today is to bring to other parts of the world the success story of the clean energy transformation in all these different countries, because they are very different when you look at them. And also, how remarkable this is compared to where we were among the most poorest countries in Europe uh, for most parts of the 20th century, and now all of us being leaders in clean energy transformation.
First Minister. Well, another aspect of the question was about how we empower young leaders to drive change. Uh, when I was in Germany last week at the climate change talks, I had a really good discussion with the, the group that is driving that here in Scotland, uh, looking to involve young leaders right across different sectors of society and being uh, in the vanguard of, of this change. And that's important because although what we're talking about today in terms of government policies is important, tackling climate change is not just the job of government, it's the job of all of us and, and we all have to be involved in that. So making sure we have a, a genuine people that understands that, that is agitating for further change in their own lives, personal and professional, and seeking to uh, drive governments to do ever more is, is really important. Um, in Scotland, as uh, we have heard this morning, we think of ourselves as a world leader, although I'm conscious I'm sitting here with some countries who are from of Scotland. Uh, we've had enormous success in decarbonising electricity supply, and uh, more than half of the electricity we use here in Scotland is now from sources and we're working towards a, a target of 100% renewable electricity. The challenges for us now are to replicate that success in heat generation and transport. That's why we have set such an ambitious target around electric vehicles. And by the very nature of what we're doing here, it becomes more challenging with every year that passes. It's more important than ever to make sure there's real momentum behind that change. Uh, the last point I would make very briefly is, you know, being in Germany at the climate change talks, and, you know, I experienced this two years ago in Paris uh, at the talks there, it brings it home to you how sometimes in our countries, while climate change and tackling climate change is recognised as important, and I think we've got cross-party consensus too, it can sometimes feel abstract. And when you meet many of the countries, and this is true of the Arctic, it's true of the Pacific, for whom right now it's a matter of life and death. It's a matter of uh, survival or, or not surviving. It really does help to underline just how a moral responsibility it is. And you know, that's why these discussions we're having today are so important. In fairness to Scotland, Iceland's got certain advantages. They've got hot water coming out of the ground. Yeah. yeah so we can't grow bananas yet, however. Paul, you wanted to come back in. Yeah, I, I forgot to, to address that. Of course, we, we support the, the Paris Agreement, that's one thing, but also that we, we in, in, in a way of, um, of having a goal, uh, we have decided that uh, before year 2030, all energy on land should be green. So that's a purpose which, which I, 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 I forgot to mention. Yeah. Thank you for that. And Right down at the front here. Can we get a microphone down here, please? Right down at this front row. There we go. If you could just pass the microphone along. Again, if you could identify yourself. Question, please. Um, Tassine Jaffrey, the Centre for Climate Justice at Glasgow Caledonian University. Um, I just want to ask this question. What more can be done to ensure that the rights of the poorest and the most vulnerable people across the New North could be protected? First Minister, do you want to take that first out? Well, I think... There is, I mean, I think it is relevant not just in an Arctic or New North context, it's, it's relevant in a, a global context as well. It's why in Scotland we put emphasis on climate justice as well as our responsibilities here at home to, to tackle climate change. And, you know, we have, and we're very proud to have been one of the first countries in the world to establish Justice Fund. We you know, announced new funding last week for projects in uh, Malawi, for example. Uh, we're also keen to support the work the UN is doing now to make sure a gender aspect to tackling climate change across the world, because that all of these things are important to making sure that while we're all working to play our part, we're you know, also remembering that for some parts of the world, and you know, this is where it's very relevant in terms of the Arctic, this is a much more immediate and much more existential challenge than it is uh, others. Uh, we uh, also, uh, I, I think, need to recognise that when it comes to uh, emissions reduction targets, uh, we all have to play the, the value and the importance of the Paris Agreement is that it recognises that every country developed or developing has to play a part in this. But the concept of, of fair uh, developed countries recognising that they have uh, an even bigger responsibility here on behalf of the most vulnerable parts of the world is, is really important, which is why 
thinking so hard about how we up the scale of our ambition in terms of emissions reductions. Uh, so, you know, the, the emphasis on climate justice for me is, is important. And I think all of us, and it's, you know, something that will no doubt be discussed here today, have got a responsibility to look on an ongoing basis at what more we can do in our effort on climate justice. Gulaga, I mean, you know, at first glance, the linkage between Iceland and somewhere like Vanuatu or Tuvalu, somewhere like that, it's not immediately apparent, but is there something about living on the edge that makes for a shared understanding, almost a sympathy? I think that we could use the uh, Icelandic uh, experience in many ways, especially when it comes to uh, this good question. If it's a big question, a very important one. Uh, I think that my generation, uh, Olaf's generation, we have seen a lot of changes in a very short time. Iceland was uh, probably the poorest nation in Western Europe in the beginning of the last century. And we would probably still be poor if we wouldn't have, for example, access to other markets and our markets wouldn't be open. But also, we have a built up infrastructure which is extremely important. And I'm not talking also about, uh, only about uh, roads and ports and, and, and airports. Uh, I'm also talking about the education and the health system. And this is something I think that we could share the experience. I think the most important thing that the people, the four million people in the Arctic, they have to rule themselves. They have to be, decide their own future uh, because uh, we need all of them. There's a lot of uh, uh, opportunities, but there are also, also challenges. And one of the challenges is definitely how we're going to see to it that everyone gains from, uh, from these different uh, things we will see in, in, the, in the near future. So, uh, but I think that, uh, as you mentioned, that we can, uh, we have something to offer there because we have seen a lot of uh, changes in very short time. And I just remember when the first time I went abroad as, as a kid and I went with a ship with my grandmother when she was a, a waitress at a, at a cargo ship, there was so much change from going from Iceland to, to Europe. It has changed uh, dramatically now, but uh, I think that we can use the experience for, for others and, and we will definitely share it in, in this contest. There, there is also another aspect of the uh, political social evolution in the north and the Arctic, uh, which is interesting in this context. Uh, perhaps a little bit risky to point it out here uh, in, in, in Scotland. But if you go back to the time uh, the foreign minister was, was talking about, the uh, people of uh, the Arctic territories, the indigenous people, the people of Iceland and the Faroe Islands and Greenland, didn't really have any uh, political autonomous authority uh, on its own, or on their own. And at that time, you had the colonial map uh, being predominant in Africa, big parts of Asia, you had a very strange situation in Central and Latin America. But what has happened in the last 40, 30, 40 years, even more recently, 20 years, 10 years, is the political empowerment of these different regions and communities. You can take Alaska, for example. I worked very closely with the late Governor Hickel of Alaska. When he was a young man, he traveled to Washington to meet Eisenhower. Because at that time, most of Alaska was under federal control, uh, governed by Washington. And they, uh, there was a delegation of young people coming to Washington to meet the president to ask for uh, some autonomous political rights for Alaska. And the answer of the president was, not in your lifetime, young man. Uh, then we have seen the transformation of uh, Alaska becoming a fully fledged uh, state within the Union and now engaging in international cooperation on its own. When uh, the former foreign minister of Iceland was sitting here in the audience and I, my good friend Jon Baldin Hannibalsson, um, uh, both of us started engaging in politics in Iceland, <clears throat> Greenland status within the Danish kingdom was like a local community in Denmark. And then they got home rule. And then <clears throat> 10 years ago or so, they were um, constitutional change of, uh, of self-government. Extraordinary transformation in political terms of this big country. You can take, uh, you 
can take uh, many of the indigenous territories in Alaska, for example, that have similarly gone through a transformation of uh, political empowerment. Uh, explained by the Premier of the Northwest Territories at the Arctic Circle Assembly uh, last month uh, in Iceland. You have the Far Islands, of course, yeah. which uh, my friend here could explain in, in, in greater te detail. It's very interesting how these Northern Arctic Territories have become laboratories of political empowerment of communities and indigenous people in the last few decades. It's one of the most interesting as a political scientist of the political democratic transformation in terms of self-governing empowerment of people. And I personally believe that process is not at an end. I think that process will continue in one way uh, or another. Yeah. Last word from you, Paul. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, of course, uh, to achieve this goal, uh, what I mentioned, we, we are not uh, that happy that the Icelanders, that they have the energy downstairs, there, somewhere, deep down. We have to, to, differ, uh, to, to make different kinds of, of solutions. We work with the wind, we work with water and current stream, and to reuse water. And of course, um, um, all this, um, this do that this to, that we have to work on different uh, um, um, angles. And uh, at the moment, I see that like, we work with the EU on 2020, where we do um, invest not so little of, of money to, 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 to scientists to, to achieve a better result. And also, um, um, we see work with, the, with companies how to, to keep um, the energy uh, uh, stocked, how to use it in a long term, and, not, and, and because, you know, a lot of the good waste, how can we try to, to stock it in a way where it uh, is feasible to, to use 100% uh, of the energy which we achieve? Thank you. First Minister. I want to pick up on President Grimson's point. I, I will resist the temptation to comment on future constitutional developments uh, in Scotland or anywhere else, but I think the point he makes is fundamental and it, it applies very strongly to Scotland. If, if you think of many of the innovations, policy uh, developments in Scotland right now, whether uh, the, the innovations in climate change, the innovations we're pursuing in, in public health, uh, or you know, the focus on industrial policy that I've been involved in all weekend, these things would not be happening, or it's very unlikely that they would be happening with the same if Scotland didn't have a parliament and a government of its own able to focus on that kind of innovation. And I think the point that is being made here is a, a, an important one. Whether it's national level, sub-national level, or much more local level, the more you empower people in their own spaces and their own communities to come up with these solutions, uh, the more likely they are to do so effectively. And I, I think that's a point that is well worth underlining. Thank you very much for that.